Um, yeah, so it's a great pleasure to get to talk to you today about uh, the kinds of things that we've been doing um, in our attempts to help uh, brain scientists and brain doctors to understand and help repair the brain. I direct a group at MIT that takes an engineering approach to brain science. Um, and so uh, the motivating idea is to really understand the complexity of the brain. Um, personally, I'm very motivated by this idea of making a simulation of the brain. Could you, in a computer, uh, create things that look like decisions or emotions. Um, but uh, far short of that, even if we could understand a single process of the brain of any kind, whether it's in a healthy or diseased state, would be very, very uh, helpful to many people. And so there are uh, three technology tasks that motivate us, uh, shown in blue here. One is to make a map of the brain. Um, and I'll tell you why that's so complicated in a second. The second is to control the computations of the brain so we can repair them. And the third is to observe what happens in the brain in real time so that we can uh, measure computation while it's happening and correct it. Combine all three, as I'll tell you at the end, and I hope we can try to make simulations of the brain, but even any of the technologies alone uh, can be quite helpful. And two of the three tool sets I'll talk about are in use by thousands and thousands of, of scientists. So why is this so hard? <clears throat> brain diseases and brain disorders and brain conditions uh, are daunting. They're very complicated. Uh, none of them can be uh, fully cured. Look at Alzheimer's disease or stroke, Parkinson's disease, the list goes on and on. Um, and the treatments are partial. Uh, in, in many cases, the treatments don't work very well at all for many of the, of the patients. And I would argue this is because of the complexity of the brain. Um, the brain is so complicated that we really don't understand any brain condition, disease, disorder very, very well. Um, this is, uh, is from a science editorial about a decade ago. I think the numbers are even worse now. But it commented that for brain drugs to go out of the lab and into the, into the marketplace takes almost a decade. The failure rate for approval is over 95% failure. I think the numbers have actually gone up. Uh, the cost is, I think, at $2 billion US dollars each to do the translational path. And even if all those hurdles are met, uh, the treatments often don't work very well. So why is the brain so complicated? Well, I'd argue there are two issues, space and time. Let's start with space. Brain cells are enormous things, right? Uh, centimeters in spatial extent. The ones that go down our spinal cord, a meter in length, by far the largest cells in the human body. But these cells have very complex shapes. They're wired up in very complex patterns. And those wires, those cellular processes, are nanoscale in dimension. And even worse, chock full of nanoscale objects. You know, the human genome are thousands of genes and encode for biomolecules. Those are nanoscale things that are often organized with nanoscale precision. So how can you go from nanoscale to macroscale in a way that captures the biological information? Now, if that was all we were dealing with, that would still be very daunting. But it's worse. There's also time as an issue. So if you're studying learning or development, aging or Alzheimer's, these are processes, processes of years or even decades. But within the brain are electrical pulses and chemical exchanges that last a thousandth of a second, which biologically speaking is very, very fast. So again, how do you go from millisecond to year to decade? So to summarize, I think one reason why brain technology is so needed is because of this desire to cross space and time from nano to macro and millisecond to decade. So today I'll tell you a couple of short stories, mostly focusing on this first story, uh, but I'll mention a couple others in, uh, in, along the way, about how we're trying to help neuroscientists cross space and time. And this desire to go across scale is a design criteria that really motivates the development of new techniques that are very different sometimes from the ways that people have used and developed technologies in the past. OK, let's start with mapping from nano to macro. And um, that'll be the, most of the talk. Um, and I'll talk about a technique uh, called expansion microscopy. Now, how do you make a map of the brain? I think we've all seen images like this. Brain scans are very popular. They've been used in half a million uh, published studies of the human brain. They're not invasive, which is why they're popular. But they're not looking at individual brain cells. These voxels or yellow blobs that you see um, uh, can contain thousands, millions, sometimes billions of brain cells. And what you're measuring is not direct neural activity or neural connections or neural anatomy, 
In this case, you're looking at blood flow, sort of an indirect measure of brain function. Now, the other extreme are microscopes. That's how neurons were discovered in the first place by people like Ramon y Cajal over 100 years ago. And even they struggle to see very tiny things. Light has a finite size or wavelength, and so it's hard to see things much smaller than the, the wavelength of light uh, multiplied by a, a linear factor. So those biomolecules and the neural connections I mentioned earlier are uh, smaller than the wavelength of light. So many people have tried to overcome the limit of microscopes. There are super-resolution microscopes, there's electron microscopy, there's the X-ray methods, um, but all these struggle to image large 3D objects like the brain, and they all require um, equipment and skill sets that most biologists do not have access to. And so in our group, we often think, well, what if we just do the opposite of what everybody's doing? And so we started thinking many years ago, well, people have been using lenses to zoom into biological structures for literally hundreds of years. What if we take a biological structure and physically enlarge it? And so we brainstormed up many ways of trying to do this. Um, but the one that worked the first, and we are still basically building off of this idea many years later, is, is the idea of installing, chemically speaking, I'll use the mouse pointer, I guess, um, a swellable mesh of baby diaper polymer, swellable material, sodium polyacrylate or other related highly charged hydrogel backbones, and to chemically weave it inside brain cells and outside brain cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules. Do it densely and evenly enough, we thought. Add water, the hydrogel will swell, just as baby diaper polymers will absorb water, and you should be able to magnify physically the brain to make it larger. So like all techniques, this idea owes a debt to older ideas. And so one very important paper that inspired us was this paper from 1980 from Toyuchi Tanaka, one of the pioneers of smart gels. And so uh, in this paper, uh, he and his colleagues worked out the phase transition-like physics, where you can take a hydrogel, sodium polyacrylate, with some water, add more water to it, and you'll get this osmotic swelling. Shown in this cartoon, the white threads are the sodium polyacrylate polymer, and they're being swollen apart from each other. Polyacrylate has carboxyl groups up and down the polymer backbone, so it's very highly charged. And as the polymer threads start to be uh, pulled apart from each other, you get this charge repulsion that makes the expansion even bigger. So you can get this thousand-fold volumetric increase in size in a matter of minutes. So um, we thought the physics of this looked pretty well behaved, and maybe we could even make it into a controlled and reversible and isotropic process. But then the question is, how do you get the polymer inside the brain? You can't just put it on top, right? You have to get it inside the brain cells. So strangely enough, in 1981, a paper came out from Christine Dreyer and Peter Hausen where they actually kind of worked out how to do that. They installed an uncharged, relatively uncharged hydrogel, polyacrylamide. You could think of polyacrylate as the charged cousin. And they chemically weave this spiderweb-like mesh of polyacrylamide hydrogel into fixed embryos and tadpoles. They use this to facilitate the staining and imaging of these cells and tissues. So it's fun to think if somebody had put two and two together, the talk I'm giving now could have been given 40 years ago. Okay, so here's the idea. Can we take a brain cell like the golden one on the left and pull apart the building blocks of life so it looks like something on the right? So of course, this won't work on a living thing. This works only on preserved cells and tissues. But the idea is that you get a constellation of biomolecules hovering in space, the relative organization preserved, but everything's been physically magnified. So two biomolecules that were touching are now some minimum distance apart, and two biomolecules that are some distance apart will be scaled up by a linear factor. Now, to make this work, we had to develop a whole bunch of chemistries uh, in order to make the process even, to retain biomolecules of the right kind, and to get the expansion factor big and to be isotropic. And that's illustrated in the following couple of cartoons. So in this cartoon, one of the innovations was to figure out how to build handles for different biomolecules. So in brown are proteins, in purple are some handles that we can covalently attach to the proteins so that they can be used by the polymer to pull the molecules apart from each other. And we now have handles that can bind to proteins, DNA, RNA, and other kinds of biomolecules. Next, we have to weave a dense spiderweb-like mesh of this baby diaper polymer, the sodium polyacrylate. We use a reaction strategy called free radical polymerization, a very standard method where monomers, here shown as white spheres of sodium acrylate, will undergo free radical vinyl addition into these long chains of, um, of sodium polyacrylate. And when those chains encounter a handle, they'll form a covalent bond. 
and this is again using strategies very much like the, the Hausen and Dreyer paper from, from 40 years ago. Okay, we're almost there, right? Well, there's one more step we had to develop, which is we have to soften up the specimen. The biomolecules are often in very intricate complexes, and so we have to use detergents, heat, enzymes, or all three to loosen up or sometimes even destroy molecules if we don't need them anymore. Um, but at the very least, we loosen them up, add water, and now the sodium polyacrylate will absorb the water. Uh, but because of the softening, because of the hydrogel that permeates between the molecules, and because of the anchoring, we get this expansion. You can also see a hint of the topology of the polymer as well. So it's cross-linked so that the mesh size or spacing between the polymer threads is very, very small, perhaps just one to two nanometers, um, which led us to, to think that the uh, fundamental precision could be quite good. So we announced the discovery that we could physically magnify biological specimens in 2015. Panel B is a piece of the mouse brain, a couple of millimeters on the side. Panel C, the same piece of mouse brain tissue, about a day and a half later, we've blown it up 100 times in volume, about four and a half times in each of the X, Y, and Z directions. And the polymer, polymer mesh starts out very, very densely and um, ends up in an extended conformation. Here's a little movie that we made of a time lapse of the brain tissue being expanded. Um, this was polymerized earlier, and then we're just going to add the water right about here. There we go. So this is about half an hour sped up to half a minute, but you can see this piece of the mouse brain, about a centimeter wide and four or five millimeters. Um, in the vertical dimension there, um, maybe about a couple hundred microns thick, uh, being expanded as we add water. So the hope here is that we can do very, very high-speed imaging uh, with nanoscale precision on ordinary microscopes. The magnification is being done physically, and you can then use potentially very, very cheap optics to make maps of the brain or other biological structures. But the first question that we always got in the early years was, is expansion even? And so in the early days especially, we would take lots of pre-expansion images with a classical nanoimaging method, like the kind I mentioned earlier, and then we would take post-expansion images um, with a conventional off-the-shelf uh, microscope, the kind that most biology labs can have access to either in their own lab or through local facilities at their university or hospital. And so the distortion is not zero, but it's pretty darn small. It's a few percent over a typical microscope field of view. Here we have some cultured uh, HEC293 T cells, human cells in a dish. We decorate certain proteins with antibodies that bind those proteins that bear fluorophores. And here you can see microtubules that are lighting up because we've equipped them with antibodies with fluorophores against, uh, and, the, and the antibodies are against tubulin. Um, and so it turns out that for the vast majority of the kinds of things that biologists and doctors are interested in right now, a few percent of distortion is, is just fine. What about the resolution? Can you see smaller things? Well, if we expand four and a half fold and we're using an ordinary microscope with a resolution of around 300 nanometers lateral resolution, which is typical for a good confocal microscope, let's say, you might expect that you could get a resolution of 300 divided by four and a half, around 70 nanometers or so. And that's what we find when we compare what we see to known ground truth, thanks to decades of imaging with the earlier techniques I mentioned. Uh, so again, here we're decorating microtubules with fluorescent antibodies. We can see uh, the microtubules, and we know what they should look like, thanks to earlier work. So we can take what we see and compare it. And uh, we find, indeed, a 70 nanometer resolution or so. Now, that raises the question, if we expand, can expand bigger, can we see even more detail? And as I'll show you later, that's true. But even with four and a half fold expansion, there are many things that we can see that are difficult and sometimes impossible to see with earlier techniques. So one thing that we immediately found out was being able to image with nanoscale precision on an ordinary microscope not only democratizes nanoimaging, but also ordinary microscopes are pretty good at imaging over extended volumes. And most nanoimaging methods struggle to do that. So even from day one, it was pretty clear that we could take a block of tissue, let's say a couple millimeters on the side, and then expand it and image it on an ordinary confocal microscope, uh, a volume that would be very, very difficult, if not impossible to image for most groups on Earth. So here we're zooming in from top to bottom. Each white square is a zoom in uh, that's shown in the panel below. The color code is on the left. These are uh, proteins that we're decorating with fluorescent antibodies. Um, and on the left is pre-expansion. On the right, 
same specimen, same microscope, but post-expansion. And so I hope you can see that the purplish fuzz in the lower left, it's really hard to see, right, because we hit the resolution limit of the microscope. In the lower right, we can cleanly resolve the subcomponents. So the purplish fuzz can actually be resolved in terms of blue and pink subdomains. Those are pre- and postsynaptic proteins at neural synapses, neural connections in the brain. If we measure the distance between those protein densities, we get the same answer that Catherine Duloc and Zhao Zhuang measured many years ago with super-resolution microscopy, namely storm microscopy invented by Zhao Wei. Um, and it's a nanoscale distance, but now we can make that measurement on an ordinary confocal microscope. I should point out this initial study was done by two then grad students in our group, Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg. Working with Eric Betzig, another super-resolution pioneer, uh, we started wondering um, how fast can we go? Now, when you expand something in water, let's say you expand it 100 times in water, it's about 99% water, so it's completely transparent. And Eric had invented a light sheet microscope where you can shine light from one angle and you take a picture from a 90 degree angle so you can go blazingly fast speeds. And what we found, looking at mitochondria and lysosomes in the upper right, looking at myelination in the bottom, is that by expanding and using this light sheet trick that Eric's group developed, you can go you know, on the order of almost a thousand times faster than the nearest um, nanoscale competition. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And um, you know, it's just a matter of going faster by uh, increasing the performance of the optics, right? Faster cameras, faster motors, and so forth. This work was done by Ray Gao, Sho Asano, and Goku Pagula. So one thing I'm very excited about is this idea of making maps of the brain. We can take fluorescent proteins, for example, from jellyfish and coral, and express them in the brain with viruses, expand, and then start to trace circuitry of the brain. So this video shows a small piece of the mouse hippocampus, the part of the brain involved with memory formation, amongst other things. And it's very tantalizing to think that by color coding these cells, by expressing different glowing proteins of them, and then expanding them, maybe we could read out um, you know, maps of the brain detailed enough to look at things like memories and so forth. Now, the mouse brain is big, um, but I'm also very interested in small brains. So we're now zooming into the fruit fly brain, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, which has about 100,000 brain cells. And so we um, started by a zoomed out view of the brain, and then we started flying into the brain. In this case, all the dopamine producing cells are expressing a fluorescent protein. Not shown here, but all the synapses are also labeled. They're not shown here because if we showed them, then that's all you would see. Um, but it's very appealing to think that we could image an entire brain, all of its inputs, all of its outputs, and all of the processing nodes within to make a complete map of the brain. Now, all I've shown you so far is imaging proteins, but there are many other kinds of biomolecules in the brain. There's the DNA, the RNA, lots of kinds of biomolecules. Uh, when Oswasi joined our group, and Gao Ji Yang and Yi Kui made a very inexpensive version of this that's now on BioArchive, we added looking at nucleic acids to the mix. So we can add a protein maker. You can see here a fluorescent protein shown in green. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in pink, uh, we are labeling RNAs, nucleic acids, um, so that, I don't know if I have some water here. Maybe I could. Oh, this is for me? Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry, I think my throat's a bit dry. I don't want to cough into the microphone, so maybe I can <coughs> do it once and get it over with. Okay. So here we're labeling um, nucleic acids in pink, messenger RNAs, uh, and also visualizing proteins. This is a yellow fluorescent protein shown in green. And so we can visualize single RNA molecules with nanoscale precision in intact brain circuitry. Now, how big can you expand? So far, what I've shown you are expansion factors of approximately four. But what if we could expand bigger? Um, so there are many ways to do that. You can change the polymer recipe so that you can expand further. And many groups have worked on very clever ways of doing that. But eventually, of course, the polymer can't be expanded infinitely because it will fall apart. And so when J.B. Chang was a postdoc in our group, we developed a strategy where we could take a specimen, polymerize and expand it, form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion, and expand it again. And you can do that as many times as you want, it turns out. Um, I'll focus on a new version developed by Neblina Sarkar, Jinyun Kang, and Aswasi, um, since this uses all off-the-shelf chemicals, which we published last year. So um, this gives you 20-fold expansion, 
which in principle would take a 300 nanometer lens and give you 15 to 20 fold res uh, nanometer, 15 to 20 nanometer resolution. Now I want to emphasize something different that um, is becoming clear with some of these recent papers. Uh, we can take a specimen and when you, of course, are doing light microscopy, you're often visualizing a fluorescent tag that you add. I mentioned fluorescent antibodies being very popular in my earlier slides. Now antibodies or other tags have you know, some non-zero size, right? So the green and red antibodies can decorate the outsides of proteins on a complex of proteins, but they can't get inside. If you pull the proteins apart though, now you make room for the yellow and blue antibodies to get inside. So we started wondering, could we convert invisible molecules into visible ones? Now many proteins, of course, are densely packed with other proteins. That's how they work, right? They communicate with each other by binding to each other, changing each other's conformation, modifying, cleaving them, and so forth. So we thought in neural connections, synapses, proteins are very densely packed. Maybe by expanding them, we could see them better. So here, it's kind of a crowded slide, but in panels B, C, and D, we illustrate something. Uh, in yellow is pre-expansion staining with fluorescent antibodies, and there's not much yellow. In pink, same specimen, same antibody, we restain after expansion, and you get much more staining in the pink channel. This means that many proteins are crowded, but by pulling them apart, we can make room for labeling. Now, not all proteins are crowded. Here in the lower right, you can see a couple proteins where the yellow and the pink look almost identical. And by the way, that's one reason how we know that this is not just nonspecific staining. The pink is appearing where it should be, where the yellow reference stains are. This is work done with Tom Blampede at the University of Maryland. What about in neurodegeneration and other diseases? Many uh, brain diseases and other diseases are characterized by aggregates of proteins or other kinds of densely packed changes in cells. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, amyloid plaques are very famously involved, although the mechanism of action uh, is still, I think, a bit unclear. So working with Li Wei Sai at MIT, we decided let's try to look at amyloid plaques and see if we can see them better if we expand them before we label them. We started with Alzheimer's model mice. So in yellow is pre-expansion staining with an antibody against A beta, one of the major components of amyloid plaques. And then in pink, the same antibody and the same field of view. You can see much more detail. In fact, you can even see these little tendrils of amyloid that uh, you know, radiates out from these plaques further than I think had been previously described. We saw this with multiple different antibodies against A beta, and we never saw them in normal wild type mice. So our hope is that in many parts of normal and abnormal brain function and disease biology, maybe we can start to characterize densely packed proteins better. Pablo Valdez Cuevero, a neurosurgeon working with us, wondered if we can see invisible proteins, maybe we can see invisible cells. He works with brain cancer patients and removes brain cancers uh, from glioma patients. Uh, aggressive tumor cells in glioma patients are characterized by expression in bimentin, shown in cyan, and GFAP, shown in pink. The top few rows are images of an actual brain tumor from an actual patient uh, with antibody staining against bimentin and GFAP, amongst other things. The bottom two rows are with the same specimen and the same antibodies, but when the specimens were restained after expansion. I hope you can see much more detail and much more staining. Importantly, this second to last row is when Pablo expanded, stained, and then shrank the specimen back down to its original size by adding salt. And interestingly, even, when the map, even if you don't care about resolution, getting better staining, he argued, might be of interest to you. He got a team of people together, scientists and doctors, and they decided to count the number of aggressive tumor cells, the Vimentin GFAP double positive cells. And so it's a crowded slide, but if you look where a mouse is pointing, and again, this is done with no physical magnification, expand, label, shrink it back down. Even with a better staining and no additional resolution, the post-expansion staining yielded a count of six times as many aggressive tumor cells um, as with pre-expansion staining. I guess we should say putative aggressive tumor cells because maybe this is a different cell type than had been previously characterized. This is all very new, and so much more research, I think, is needed to know whether there actually are more tumor cells or whether this is a different cell type than the classical aggressive tumor cells. Uh, but the point is that we should know more about what's going on here in the brain. When Yongshan Zhao and Octavia Bikir were working with us and with many pathology groups, Astrid Wines, Tu Schnitt, and Beck and others, we showed that we could uh, expand all sorts of other kinds of human tissues, prostate, lung, breast, pancreas. On the left are normal, 
and on the right are cancer-containing specimens from human patients. And uh, we started wondering, you know, early in a disease, it's hard to diagnose a disease because the changes are small. If we physically magnify the specimen, though, can we make those early small changes more big and obvious? Uh, Stu Schnitt, one of the pathologists I mentioned, um, uh, was particularly interested in breast cancer because early in breast cancer, doctors might disagree about the diagnosis half the time, 50-50, right? A coin flip, basically. So he convened a team of pathologists and they graded human breast cancer biopsies from human patients with classical staining and then the very same specimens after they were expanded and restained. The committee voted on what they thought the diagnoses were, and the votes were used to train a simple machine learning classifier. In pink is the cross-validation when this machine learning classifier uh, was trained on the pre-expansion votes, and the green circles are the machine learning classifier performance on this cross-validation data set test when it was trained on the post-expansion votes. And I hope you can see that the post-expansion um, analyses are much more consistent. Uh, in fact, even these early stages, like usual ductal hyperplasia versus abnormal ductal hyperplasia, where the doctors might disagree 50-50, um, this machine learning algorithm was able to do the early disease detection much more consistently. So to summarize, we've discovered we can physically magnify biological specimens, and this does enable nanoimaging to be performed on ordinary microscopes, so we've kind of democratized nanoimaging, so to speak. This slide isn't really meant to be read, but the point is that it's being used all over biology. People are looking at the human kidney, at the microbiome, you know, at um, you know, the architecture of the nucleus, at motor proteins, you know, um, and all sorts of stuff all over biology and medicine. The number, of the number of experimental papers and preprints is about to hit 500 any day now. Um, and importantly, we have a big culture of teaching because we do want to help anybody learn how to do nanoimaging. After all, if the fundamental building blocks of life are nanoscale, and biology in the end is about these nanoscale things working together or failing to work together, in the case of disease states, then let's help, help everybody do nanoimaging. Um, the second story, of course, is that by expanding things away from each other, we can facilitate their labeling. And this is both synergistic and also independent of the resolution enhancement of expansion. So there might be two discrete payoffs here of the expansion methodology. We have a big culture of teaching, so on our website, expansionrecloskity.org, we share all of our protocols freely. We used to have a lot of hands-on teaching classes, um, uh, and now many institutions are running them on their own. In fact, there's one running as we speak, um, hosted by EMBL. Um, but uh, with COVID breakouts, outbreaks, of course, we could not have such hands-on teaching. So in summer 2020, we posted photographic step-by-step -step tutorials of how to do expansion, including, you know, rudimentary steps like how to use a pair of forceps or how to use a paintbrush to pick up specimens. Now, um, one interesting thing uh, that kind of emerged uh, in a group meeting in our lab was, well, if expansion of something can be even, right? You're, you're magnifying a specimen and preserving the nano information. And as I mentioned, you can shrink it back down by adding salt, right? Could you just run the process in reverse? Imagine you take the baby diaper polymer, the sodium polyacrylate, and add water to swell it. Then you could, like in the upper left of this slide, laser print interesting things inside the expanded polymer. You can do photoconjugation and attach different dyes that are photoactivated, different points in the polymer by scanning a laser around. You could then deposit interesting materials like quantum dots or pieces of DNA or metallic nanoparticles and then dehydrate it to shrink it down. Could it be a cheap way of making nanotechnology? So in Dan Oran and Sam Rodriguez from my group, we actually tried this out, which we call implosion fabrication. And uh, just as the expansion was nanoprecise, so was the shrinkage nanoprecise. So we would shrink, uh, we would put metallic nanoparticles in and shrink them down to form lines. We could actually then do silver, we could do silver deposition actually and make conducting nanowires in the process. But if you look at the error bars here, these are different samples. Different samples are the yellow bars. So sample to sample variability could be as small as five to 10 nanometers. And then the dots are individual lines within a sample. Within a sample, the variability also could be on the order of maybe a few, a few tens of nanometers. So we're very excited that maybe this could enable the creation of nanoscale resolution objects with common biology equipment. And several groups have now gone on to show that they can make interesting metallic structures uh, and even holographic structures um, through implosion fabrication. So that wraps up the bulk of my uh, talk, uh, although I do want to talk about a couple other techniques. 
uh, because expansion microscopy does have an obvious limitation. I don't think it's ever going to work on a living thing. By pulling the building blocks of life apart from each other, they do stop communicating with each other. And so in the last few minutes of the talk, I would like to just briefly outline a couple of things that we've been doing that we think are very complementary for the understanding and repair of the brain. But I won't go into these techniques in as much detail. One tool set um, we call optogenetics, and this is a technology that allows us to control brain activity while it's alive. Now, ideally, we could you know, use these, tool, tool, these two tools together, right? Make a map of the brain, and then we could use optogenetics to perturb activity in the brain and go back and forth between these two kinds of, of data. So in optogenetics, we put light-sensitive molecules from the natural world into brain cells. They have basically little solar panels to use the you know, consistent theme, I guess, that we could weave across the talks of the day. Um, and then you can bring light into the brain the same way that electrodes are brought into the brain and shine light on individual cells. Now, how do we do that? Well, it turns out that all over the tree of life, you can find molecules that convert light into electrical signals. So this is a single cell green alga, and they swim around in bodies of water. They have two flagelli that you can see here that will, will move. How do they see sunlight, though, right? They need to go right to the right level of the water so you get just enough sunlight, but not too much. That would cause you know, DNA damage, let's say, right? We just zoomed into an eye spot of this green alga, and you can uh, see in this cartoon that this eye spot is chock full of light-sensitive ion channels. And you can find light-sensitive ion channels and pumps all over the tree of life that convert light into some kind of ionic flux. There are seven transmembrane proteins that at a glance might look a lot like the molecules in our eyes, but they work quite differently. The molecules in our eyes convert light to a cascade of chemical signals. These molecules directly will transport charged particles, ions, in response to light. So some of them really do act a little bit like you know, the protein equivalent of a, of a light-sensitive you know, solar uh, device, although, of course, they work in a very different way. Now, this is where we got lucky. Being a seven transmembrane protein, um, we can take the gene that encodes for it and put it into brain cells using a gene therapy vector, uh, such as a virus. And uh, this is where we got really lucky. Um, it turns out the brain cells will manufacture the light-sensitive protein. Uh, the light-sensitive protein needs a molecule called all transretinal, a vitamin A variant, to function. It turns out that's, for reasons we still don't really understand, found naturally in the mammalian brain shine light and you could turn brain cells on because when you shine light, those light activated ion channels open a pore and let a positive charge in and you can drive neural action potentials or spikes, the very same kind of electrical pulses that are happening in, in your brain as I say these words. So flash forward to the current day, you know, work by many people in our group and other groups uh, has now shown that we can find light sensitive ion pumps and ion channels um, that will allow us to shut down brain activity and by shutting down brain activity, you can figure out what it's needed for, or you can activate brain activity and see what is sufficient to drive. So light-sensitive um, ion channels, we can put a gene that encodes for these into brain cells and activate them to see if they trigger a behavior or a beneficial effect or a disease state. The first of these was done with uh, myself, collaborating with Carl Dysroff in 2005, and then Nathan Kopetke and others worked to make these reach their physical limits of performance. And then light-driven ion pumps, such as the ones that transport protons or chloride, can be used um, to shut down neural activity. And this is work done by Brian Chow, Chia Han, and Amy Chuang uh, when they worked with me. So let's show you a couple examples of the kinds of things that we can do with this technique. This is work done by Chris Fiorillo's group, where they want to study dopamine neurons. So I alluded to dopamine neurons earlier. In the popular press, they're often called the pleasure center of the brain, but of course, they're they're very complex. They're involved with all sorts of changes from learning and memory to habit formation to addiction. And so what Chris and his team did was to equip, genetically equip mice with a light-activated ion channel so we could drive the neuron with blue light, put the gene for the light-activated ion channel in the dopamine neurons, take a blue laser and shine light through an optical fiber at those neurons. And then the question is, what does the brain do? So we devise a simple behavior where if a mouse goes to one point in a box and, and pokes its nose into a sensor, it gets a pulse of blue light. If it goes to the other point of the box, nothing will happen. As so you can see, the mouse poke its nose, gets a pulse of blue light from the laser, does it again, does it again. I think you can see the pattern here. The mouse is basically working for light. And so this shows that a single activation of these cells is enough to make the brain do more of what it was just doing. 
So over the years, many, many people, thousands of scientists, uh, just as you know, are using uh, optogenetics, as we call it, opto for light, and genetics, because these are genetically encoded constructs to study the brain. But intriguingly, two summers ago, an interesting shift happened, which was when a European team um, between Switzerland and, and France, Bolton Roska and Jose Alain Sahel and others, showed that they could actually put these into the human body. So how does this work? <clears throat> well, there are many people who have lost the photoreceptors in their eyes through genetic causes like retinitis pigmentosa. In such a case, their, lies, their eyes cannot capture light anymore. And so what their team did was to take a molecule that we had reported in 2014, a red light activated depolarizer of neurons, so we named crimson, and they put the gene into the human eye of a patient with retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, he's wear, he wears a pair of goggles that takes the ambient light and, that, and, and you know, focuses it on the air of the retina, which has been resensitized to light. And also it you know, converts the, the light in the ambient environment into the right color because you know, we're not restoring color vision here. Uh, it's just a, a molecule that responds best to orange red light. Um, and over some time, I think he had to relearn how to use his eyes in a way, um, he was able to make out household objects or see the lines of a crosswalk and have a partial restoration of functional vision. So it's not perfect. He wasn't able to recognize faces or read words, but uh, to my knowledge, it's one of the best restorations of functional vision um, done in a blind patient to date. Um, and and the, the teams are working to improve it further. Uh, as another example of the therapeutic implications, um, this is work led by Li Wei Sai's group at MIT. She used optogenetics to drive the brain 40 times a second, 40 hertz, um, in mice uh, that are engineered to get uh, Alzheimer's-like symptoms. And amazingly, the brains got better. Work led by Hannah Iacurino and Annabelle Singer working across our groups. Um, now, of course, if you can make it non-invasive, you might be able to help a lot more people. And so with uh, uh, the collaborative help of Emery Brown, an expert on brain rhythms at MIT, uh, the teams went on under Lee Wei's leadership to show that you could drive the same brain rhythms by having the mice watch a flickering light or hear a clicking sound. No need for any implant, no need for any gene therapy here. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, so we actually have now an, ex uh, 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 you know, uh, an experiment to try to see if we can help people uh, by uh, helping them see the clicking light, uh, the flickering light and the clicking sound, and to see if that can improve uh, Alzheimer's uh, functions, uh, even in human patients. So to summarize this uh, second little mini part, because uh, we're almost out of time, with optogenetics, people can drive neural activity with light in animals. Uh, it's being used very widely, just as with expansion microscopy in biology to study the brain and other biological systems. But very recently, the clinical implications are also becoming clear with inspiring uh, treatments for diseases that are in human trials and also maybe even being directly used in human patients. Um, so I'll just end with a, a, lot, a couple last slides for almost out of time. Um, what about the opposite of optogenetics? Could you watch the brain in action? And for this, of course, you know, with optogenetics, we were just so lucky, right? These molecules out of the natural world by themselves were enabled to enable, were sufficient to enable the safe control of neural activity with light. Just put the gene in and it does everything you want. To image the brain though, we haven't been so lucky. So we've been building robots to evolve molecules that will light up when the brain is active. This is work done by Erika Jung and Kirill Pyakovich who are there in my group we worked with robotic arms that could pick out mutant genes that might have properties that are better for our application. In this case, we wanted to build a fluorescent voltage indicator, a molecule that would light up when a brain cell was active. To make a long story short, we were able to do just that. Uh, we started with a parent molecule and made lots of mutations in it and screened for the mutants that would be brighter, fluorescent, glowing indicators of neural activity. And to cut to the point, uh, working with Shirohan's group at BU, we were able to make a molecule which will, when we illuminate with red light, will glow in the infrared, and the amount of glowing will look a lot like an electrode trace. Uh, it's proportional to voltage. Now, interestingly, this molecule is a mutated optogenetic molecule, and it responds, as you can see, to red light. So you can imagine using blue light to activate a cell and red light to read out the activity, right? All optical interfacing to the living brain. And if optogenetics can be used in the living human body, uh, which you know, these early studies suggested it might, then it's interesting to think about whether these mutated optogenetic molecules can be used to read activity from the living human body as well. So we're very excited about this idea of all optical neural interfacing
being a possibility. So I think I'll end there. To summarize, we've been finding out ways to make maps of the brain and other biological systems from molecule to system scale, and to image and control the dynamics of biological systems. These tools are individually quite useful, and we disseminate all of them freely, um, but I'm also very excited to try to combine them. What if you could image all the activity in a brain, perturb it strategically, and then make a map of it? Could you make a simulation of a brain at some point? And so um, over the coming years, that's an area that we would love to work more and more towards. I think I've acknowledged along the way all the people in our group who led these projects, but I want to end on this slide because a very, very long list of other people have helped with these and other projects over the years, both within the group at alumni and an even longer list of people all over the world who we collaborate with. Um, we, share, we share all of our tools freely, so please visit our website, synthneuro.org. And uh, in addition to being the professor of the group, I'm also the chief tech support person, so just email me, edboyden at mit.edu, if we can help you in any way. And with that, I can take questions.